Section forty of the Mysteries of London, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume three, by George W. M. Reynolds. Section forty. Continuation of the History of Jacob Smith. I now come to an important event in my life. In fact, that portion of it which will account for this sickly condition of health in which you see me old death one evening took me with him to supper at a place where he had never introduced me before this was bunce's in earl street seven dials mrs bunce immediately seemed to take a great fancy to me made me sit next to her and in spite of her meanness helped me to the best of everything on table it was a very good supper for old death who provided it had declared that he meant to launch out for once but i suppose it was only to put me into such a good humour that i was more than likely to fall into the scheme which he had in view this was not however the reason of mrs bunce's kindness because since then she has often treated me in a manner that has made me forget many a sorrow it is true that these likings only take her by fits and starts and she has not unfrequently used me cruelly enough i can scarcely make that woman out as far as i am concerned and there are moments when i think a great deal of any kind words she has ever uttered to me or any kind treatment she has ever shown me but i am wandering from the subject which i had entered upon you remember that i was telling you about the supper at bunce's house well after the things were cleared away and the grog was going round pretty fast i used to drink then as much as a man although little more than ten years old old death began to talk a great deal about the money that might be made by a clever lad like me being able to get admittance into the houses of rich people he went on to say that i should begin to think of doing business that would leave me more time to amuse myself and be also less dangerous than going about the streets picking pockets i assured him that i was heartily sick and tired of the life i was leading and that i wished i was old enough to be a housebreaker for said i a cracksman does have some time which he can call his own if he does only one job a week he is satisfied but i am obliged to gad about all day to get the means of living on the next besides said i i am of course running a thousand times more risk by doing so many jobs each day than i should if i only did one or two a week note seventeen everybody must have his apprenticeship returned old death and you have now served yours i agree with you that it is high time for you to be doing something better and i have a plan ready chalked out for you mrs bunce mixed me another glass of grog i produced my short pipe and blew a cloud while old death explained his scheme at first i did not much relish it but he backed it with so many arguments that i agreed to try it and sure enough at six o'clock one morning a few days afterwards a boy black as a devil with soot-bag over his shoulder and brush and scraper in his hand was making the round of bloomsbury square bawling sweep as lustily as he could that boy was myself presently a garret window opened and a female voice called me to stop i obeyed in a few minutes down came the cook to the front door and i was desired to walk in and operate on the kitchen chimney the cook was a fat middle-aged good-natured body and asked me a great many questions about myself how long i had been a sweep how it happened that i became one whether i had any father or mother and a host of such queries to all of which i replied in the most sorrowful manner possible i assured her that i had been a sweep from infancy that i had swept a chimney when i was only five years old that i had no parents that my master beat me cruelly and that i had nothing to eat since the morning before the good creature shed tears at my narrative and when i had swept the chimney which i did in a manner that scarcely bore out the assertion of my long experience she gave me a quantity of broken victuals in addition to the money earned i then took my departure having very quietly deposited half a dozen silver forks and spoons in my soot-bag while her back was turned this business i carried on successfully enough for some months till at last old death told me that he had seen several paragraphs in the papers warning people against thefts committed by sweeps i therefore gave up the employment and once more took refuge in st giles 
but my health was seriously injured by the occupation i had just renounced and from that time i have always been ailing and sickly although i had seldom turned sweep more than twice a week and an hour after each robbery that i thus committed was as clean again as if i had never been near a chimney in my life yet the seeds of disease were planted in me and i feel the effects here here in my chest the life that i led when i gave up the chimney sweep business did not certainly tend to improve my health i hired a room in st giles and took a girl into keeping i being then eleven and she thirteen of all the profligate creatures peggy wilkins was the worst the moment she awoke in the morning she must have her half quartern of gin and then she would go on drinking at short intervals all day long if i attempted to stop the supplies she would fly into the most dreadful passions break everything she could lay her hands on or else throw the domestic articles at my head when tipsy she would loll half naked out of the window and chaff the people passing in the street in the evening she went to the penny concerts or penny theatres note eighteen and generally come home so gloriously drunk that the entire house much less our little room would scarcely hold her you may wonder why i continued to live with her but the fact is i liked her in spite of her outrageous conduct and as i was sometimes very dull and low her noisy rackety disposition positively helped to put me into good spirits she knew nothing of my connection with old death but she was aware that i was laying hid in st giles in consequence of having robbed houses disguised as a sweep and she used to laugh heartily when i told her several amusing anecdotes relative to that portion of my career one night after having lived about a month in idleness in the holy land i was compelled by the falling short of supplies to call at bunce's in seven dials for the purpose of seeing old death after waiting there a short time he came in and i immediately noticed that his face was more serious than usual a certain sign that he had something new on hand i did not however venture to ask any questions for i still stood in the greatest awe of him and knew that his disposition was irritable and easy to be provoked at length he said to mrs bunce give that lad a good strong glass of grog he's shivering with cold i was not but i took the grog because i never refused spirits at that time when old death thought i was primed enough to embrace any new plan with eagerness he said jacob i have something for you to do that i am convinced will yield a good harvest i instantly became all attention there's a widow lady he continued living at the west end in a swell street and by all i can learn she is very well off she is also very charitable and belongs to a number of what's called religious societies and i am sure you could get into her house as easy as possible the chimney-sweep business has well nigh blown over if not quite and it's high time to begin a new dodge he then explained his plan and i agreed to adopt it when i got back to my lodgings in st giles i found peggy sitting in company with a young fellow of about fifteen drinking raw spirits she had not expected me home so early and was for a moment quite taken aback but soon recovering herself she put a good face on the matter and introduced the young chap as her brother saying that she had not seen him for many years before that evening when she had met him by accident i pretended to believe her but the moment he was gone i gave her a good beating and overwhelmed her with reproaches she showed less spirit than i had expected and did not attempt to return the blows neither did she treat me with sulkiness or ill-humour on the following evening at about nine o'clock i very quietly laid myself down on the doorsteps of a house in old burlington street i was in such rags and tatters as to be almost naked and having pricked my feet with a pointed bit of wood in several places they were almost covered with blood as if chapped with the cold and cut by the sharp stones this was in the depth of winter and my appearance was most miserable presently a carriage drove up to the house and a fine tall elderly gentleman got out i was crouched up close by the threshold of the door and i purposely let him tread on one of my naked feet then i began to sob as if with pain and he now observed me for the first time he muttered an oath 
but at that instant the front door opened and his manner changed directly he spoke kindly to me and put half a crown into my hand a lady was crossing the hall while the door stood open and this gentleman was still speaking to me and she immediately turned to ascertain what was the matter here's a poor wretched creature said the gentleman who was so huddled up against the door that i did not observe him and i am afraid i trod on his leg somewhat heavily the lady instantly spoke in the most compassionate terms and desired that i might be brought into the house the man-servant raised me for i affected to be unable to walk and the lady said poor boy he is paralyzed with the cold when i was moved into the hall and placed in a chair the state of my feet were observed and this increased the compassion i had already excited she ordered the servant to take me into the kitchen and give me a good supper while i warmed myself by the fire all these commands were immediately executed shoes and stockings were also supplied me and in the course of an hour the lady herself came down to speak to me she asked me who i was i told her a long and piteous tale already prepared for the occasion how i had been apprenticed to a tradesman at liverpool and had undergone the most dreadful treatment because i refused to work on the lord's day and insisted on my right to go to church how the cruelty of my master had increased to such an extent that i was obliged to run away how i had wandered about the country for the last two months subsisting on charity but often half starved how i had that morning found my way to london and had been obliged to sell my shoes for a penny to buy a roll which was all i had eaten during thirty-six hours but that i had an aunt who was a housekeeper to a certain bishop and that i knew she would do all she could for me the lady seemed to eye me suspiciously until i spoke of the aunt and the bishop and then her countenance instantly changed in my favour well my poor lad she said you shall remain here to-night and the first thing to-morrow morning one of my servants shall take a message from you to your aunt i of course expressed my gratitude for this kindness but the lady assured me that she required no thanks as heaven rewarded her for what she did towards her suffering fellow-creatures i really thought that there was something very much like what i and my usual associates were accustomed to call a gammon in all this and then i actually reproached myself for the idea and began to repent of imposing on so much virtue and goodness when i was well warmed with a cheerful fire and plentiful supper the housekeeper of this lady conducted me to a little room on the top story and having wished me a good night retired locking the door behind her but this did not give me much uneasiness for beneath my rags i had concealed the necessary means to counteract such a precaution accordingly about an hour after i had heard the servants withdraw to their bedrooms which were on the same floor as the ones where i was placed and when i thought the house was all quiet i took off the lock of the door by means of a little turnscrew and crept carefully downstairs just at that minute the clock struck eleven my intention was to visit the drawing-room first but when i reached the door i perceived there were lights within i listened and heard the gentleman and lady talking together oh ho thought i i shall have time to inspect the lady's bedroom first and perhaps secure her jewels so naturally conceiving that this chamber must be the one immediately over the drawing-room i retraced my way upstairs and entered the front apartment on the second floor a rushlight was burning in the room but no one was there i lost no time in commencing my search in all the cupboards but i found nothing except clothes there was however a mahogany press which was fast locked i drew forth a small skeleton key and was about to use it when i was alarmed by footsteps in the passage in another moment i was safely concealed under the bed some one almost immediately afterwards entered the room and only closed the door without shutting it i dared not move even to peep from beneath the drapery that hung round the bed to the floor but i could tell by the rustling of silk and the unlacing of stays that the person in the room was undressing herself and i felt satisfied it was the lady of the house i was now seriously alarmed she was evidently going to bed and my only chance of escaping from the chamber was when she should be asleep but might i not disturb her my situation was very unpleasant and a prison seemed to open before my eyes 
in about a quarter of an hour the lady stepped into bed how i longed to catch the first sound that should convince me she was asleep but she was not dreaming of closing her eyes yet a while for scarcely had she laid herself down when the door was gently opened then carefully closed again and another person evidently without shoes or boots on came into the room they said a few words to each other and to my astonishment i found that the gentleman who had arrived in his carriage which of course had been sent away was going to pass an hour in company with a charitable lady well thought i this is the way in which heaven rewards her for all she does towards her suffering fellow-creatures the gentleman undressed himself and got into bed nearly two hours instead of an hour passed away very pleasantly it seemed for the lady and gentleman and very much to my amusement i was now no longer under any alarm on account of myself for i had learnt a secret which placed the lady in my power well the gentleman got up at last and dressed himself and the lady went downstairs with him to bolt the street door after him their movements were so cautious that i could plainly perceive the servants must have fancied that the gentleman had gone away long before and that this care was taken to avoid disturbing them with any noise likely to excite suspicion the moment the lady had left the room with her lover i thought of beating a retreat but should i go empty-handed no and yet i had not time to force open the mahogany press which i believe must contain her jewels before she would come back as she had gone down in her night-clothes i therefore resolved to stay where i was and accomplish my purpose when she was asleep because if matters did come to the worst and she should awake she dared not expose me so i laid quiet and she came back in a few minutes shivering with the cold for i could hear her teeth actually chatter half an hour afterwards she was fast asleep as i could tell by her deep and regular breathing the rushlight still burnt in the room and i crept carefully from beneath the bed yes she was sleeping and though not a young woman she appeared very beautiful but i had not a minute to lose my skeleton key was again at work the bolt of the lock flew back and the door of the press moved on its hinges move yes and creak too most awfully so that the lady started up in bed and uttered a faint scream i instantly rushed up to her saying in a low but determined tone madam not a word or i betray you and your lover by the feeble light of the candle i saw that she became as red as crimson yes madam i continued your tricks are known to me and i have been all the while concealed under this bed you she exclaimed why surely you are the poor boy that i received into the house this evening to be sure i am ma'am was my answer and being troubled with a habit of sleep-walking i found my way to this room but what were you doing at the bureau merely examining it in my sleep ma'am this is ridiculous she said impatiently i understand what you are but i will treat you well on condition that you do not mention to a soul what you have been witness of this night i have no interest in gossiping ma'am and were you to do so i can deny all you may state added the lady who was dreadfully excited and nervous as you may suppose but if you follow my directions i will reward you well i readily gave a promise to that effect she then took a reticule from a chair by the side of the bed and drawing out her purse emptied its contents into my hands at a rapid glance i saw there could not be less than fifteen or sixteen sovereigns besides a little silver she then took from her bag a bank-note for twenty pounds which she also gave me i secured the money about my person and she asked me whether i was satisfied i said perfectly then stand aside for a few moments and i will show you how to act i stepped behind the curtain while she rose and put on a dressing-gown having done which she took the rushlight in her hand and desired me to follow her as noiseless as possible we went down into the kitchen where she told me to take all the cold victuals there were in the larder and she gave me a napkin to wrap them up in there happened to be a silver spoon in one of the dishes left there most probably by accident this she also desired me to take and you may be sure i did not refuse 
these arrangements being made she led me to the front door and having reminded me of my promise not to talk about a certain affair let me out of the house i have no doubt that there was a great deal said next morning in old burlington street about the ungrateful lad who was taken in as an object of charity and who decamped in the middle of the night with the contents of the larder and a silver spoon into the bargain but you have not mentioned the name of this lady jacob interrupted tom rain i did not think it was worth while sir as she used me very well still i have a very particular reason for wishing to be informed on that head said the highwayman oh if that's the case i shall not hesitate replied jacob the name of that lady was mrs slingsby i thought so from the very first moment you began to speak of her cried tom and the name of the gentleman did you learn that yes sir answered the lad i heard the servants talking about him when i was in the kitchen his name was let me see oh yes i remember sir henry courtenay thank you jacob exclaimed tom then in a low musing tone he said poor clarence you are woefully deceived in your saint of an aunt shall i continue my story mr rainford asked jacob it will not last much longer now by all means go on my boy i would sit here till daylight sooner than miss the end thus encouraged jacob continued in the following manner note seventeen every juvenile delinquent is as anxious to rise in his profession as the military or naval officer or the member of any other hierarchy but with the votaries of crime the apex of promotion is the gibbet mr miles says i have questioned many boys of shrewd understanding concerning their opinions and the opinions of their associates as to their ultimate fate for all thieves are fatalists they look upon their inevitable doom to be either sooner or later transportation or the drop it is difficult to imagine a state of more gloomy wretchedness and more despairingly horrible than the self-conviction of condign punishment without one gleam of hope to clear the melancholy perspective punishments and whippings are therefore useless for the mind is prepared to endure more and every imprisonment is only looked upon as another step in the ladder of their sad destiny the lad is hopeless consequently reckless in his conduct hardened to the present and irreclaimable as to the future it is not by prison discipline that reformation can be effected the temptations the facilities and the love of idleness are too alluring crowds of young thieves will wait round a prison gate to hail a companion on the morning of his liberation and to carry him off to treat him and regale him for the day i have asked boys under sentence of transportation if they thought they could reform if returned again upon society and the general reply has been no their reasons for that conclusion i give in their own words if we were to be free to-morrow we must go to our old haunts and our old companions for where else can we go if we try to be honest we cannot for our pals associates would torment us to return in short we should only have to come back here at last but we are now going to another country where we hope to be honest men i have moreover questioned many lads as to what method they would adopt to prevent other boys from falling into crime and their remarks have been stop playing in the streets for a pocket is soon picked and there are many who show others how to do it and the next thing is to stop those cursed receivers for if a receiver knows a boy to have dealt with him that is to have sold him property he will make him go out to thieve he will never let him rest and even should we get into employment he will tease us till he makes us rob the master or will tell of us to the police these remarks prove the boys to be good judges of their own cases so like a skilful physician they know where to apply the remedy and as i feel convinced that many of these urchins possess every requisite to be good and useful members of society so am i certain that their reformation in a majority of cases is as practicable under proper means as their ultimate ruin is now certain under the present system note eighteen mr brandon in his preface to mr miles report makes the following observations which are too important to need any apology for their quotation if a religious fanatic brings a bill into the house for the better observance of the sabbath whose comforts are to be abridged why the poor man's and those of the middling classes 
for it is the stage-coaches and omnibuses that are to be prohibited from making their appearance while the streets may be thronged with carriages and though the labourer is not permitted to purchase his necessary food on that sacred day unable to have accomplished it before from not having received his wages till too late the preceding night yet the fishmonger may keep the turbot cool that is to grace his lordship's sunday table and send it home on the very day just in time to be prepared for dinner penny theatres too are decried and suppressed while the larger ones are permitted the reason assigned being that the company who frequent the former render the step necessary but the delinquency does not arise from cheap exhibitions it is from the inefficiency of the law to restrain the audience for in the plays themselves there is no improper language used holland a notorious thief in his examination said he had heard bad language at those places before the curtain drew up but never anything indecent on the stage this is a damning proof where the fault lies if the laws were such as to restrain vice and those properly administered it would effectually prevent the improper conduct of the loose individuals and preclude the necessity of reducing the pleasures of the poor pockets are picked every night at the royal theatres and scenes of the worst description carried on in the lobbies yet it never entered into the cranium of the wise acres that if the theatres were shut up these abominations would be effectually eradicated it is highly gratifying to witness the order and pleasure with which cheap diversions are conducted on the continent even so close to us as boulogne and calais where may be seen the lowest classes enjoying themselves in dancing and visiting the various public gardens the entrance to which is a fee equivalent to our penny another proof of the difference with which our laws are administered according to the parties affected is manifest in the proceedings against the various houses for play in the metropolis the clubs of the aristocracy and the little goes little hells etc of the poor End of section forty. Read by Celine Major. Section forty one of the Mysteries of London, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Celine Major. The Mysteries of London, Volume three by george w m reynolds section forty one conclusion of the history of jacob smith on my return to earl street seven dials which was at about three o'clock in the morning i found old death and mrs bunce sitting up for me toby having gone to bed i related the adventures which i had met with but said not a word about the intrigue of the lady and the baronet for i could not help thinking that the kind treatment i had in the first instance received from mrs slingsby deserved the reward of secrecy on that head old death very kindly permitted me to retain five pounds out of the money which i myself had obtained and i hurried back to my lodging in st giles peggy was in bed and fast asleep and i lay down by her side without awaking her when i again opened my eyes the sun was shining in the brightness of a frosty air even through the dingy panes of my window and i started up peggy had already risen and i suppose she had gone out to get things for breakfast but something like a suspicion arose in my mind and i felt uneasy i searched the pockets of the ragged pair of trousers i had purposely worn on the previous night and the five sovereigns were gone now i was really alarmed peggy had certainly decamped a farther search showed me that she had even carried off the few little articles of decent wearing apparel that i had leaving me only the miserable rags in which i had appeared at mrs slingsby's house yes peggy had run away with all i possessed that was worth the taking and now the question naturally rose in my mind will she betray me i thought her conduct was so suspicious that i determined not to give her a chance if i could help it particularly as i remembered the manner in which she took the beating i gave her and which now made me think that she had resolved on being revenged so i dressed myself in my tatters as quick as i could and got away from the house but at the end of the street i met a certain mr dykes the bow street runner whom you happen to know mr rainford and though i endeavoured to dive into a narrow court he pounced upon me in a twinkling in less than an hour i stood in the felon's dock at the police court bow street charged with a robbery committed by me in bloomsbury square in the disguise of a sweep i was remanded for a week 
and sent in the meantime to clerkenwell prison there i was placed in number twelve reception yard where mrs bunce who pretended to be my aunt in order to get admittance to me visited me in the afternoon she told me that mr bones could not possibly come to see me but that he would do all he could for me if i remained staunch and did not mention his name in any way not even to my fellow-prisoners we are afraid that you will be committed for trial said mrs bunce but all shall be done that can be done to buy off the witnesses if that won't succeed such evidence of former good character shall be given that your sentence will be a light one and in the meantime you shall have as much money as you want to live gloriously in prison mr bones has sent you up a sovereign for the present and i will bring you a good suit of clothes to-morrow so that you may go up swell before the beak next time be staunch jacob and mr bones will never desert you but if you only mention his name to a soul in an improper way he'll leave you to your fate and you'll be transported mrs bunce impressed all this on my mind but i assured her it was unnecessary as i knew that i should not better my own plight in any very considerable degree by nosing against bones whereas he might be useful to me if i behaved well in the matter she went away satisfied and i spent the rest of the day in jollification with my fellow-prisoners amongst whom my money raised me to the rank of a hero note nineteen that night i slept in the receiving ward and next morning i was taken to the bathing-room a new suit of clothes having been already sent in to me by mrs bunce but i found that i was to bathe in the same water which had already served to wash the filthy bodies of several trampers who had also been sent to prison the day before on a charge of robbery and i knew that when they entered they were covered with vermin i therefore gave the turnkey half a crown to allow me to dispense with the bath put on my new clothes and was turned into the felon's yard there i found persons who had committed all degrees of crime huddled together as if there was no difference in the charges against them a boy who had stolen a pound of potatoes value one penny myself who had stolen plate in a dwelling-house a gentleman who had wounded another in a duel and could not get bail but who was a very superior person a burglar a coiner and a man charged with murder were all in one room together it did not strike me then but it has often struck me since how wrong it was to put the boy who had stolen potatoes along with a burglar a coiner and a practised thief as i was how unjust it was to put the gentleman with any of us and how shocking it was to put a murderer along with prisoners whose hands were not at least stained with blood and what were the consequences the boy who had merely stolen the potatoes because his mother was ill and starving and who had never done anything wrong before was entirely corrupted by the coiner and made up his mind to turn prig the moment he got out the gentleman was worked up to such a pitch of excitement by being in such a society that he was removed to the infirmary and died of brain fever as i afterwards heard the burglar helped the murderer to escape and got safely away with him our amusements in jail were chiefly gambling and drinking money procured as much liquor as we could consume and with such i was well supplied cards and dice were not allowed it is true but we used to play with bits of woodcut and marked like dominoes or by chalking the table into a draught-board or by tossing halfpence then there was such fighting quarrelling and bad language that nothing could equal the place in the upper or sleeping ward things were much worse the prisoners robbed each other the very first night the duellist gentleman was there he lost his purse containing several sovereigns and when he threatened to complain he was quietly informed by the burglar and the murderer that if he did he would be hung up to the bars of the window with his own handkerchief the very next night and his end would be attributed to suicide note twenty at the end of the week i was had up to bow street once more and the evidence was so conclusive against me that i was committed to newgate for trial this i had expected and cared but little for as mrs bunce at each visit which she paid me at clerkenwell prison assured me that mr bones would do all he could for me and he kept his word but more i suppose for his own sake than mine what a dreadful place i found newgate to be hardened as i was acquainted with all degrees of debauchery and familiar with vice 
i declare solemnly that i shrank from the scenes i there witnessed fighting quarrelling gambling thieving drinking obscene talking bullying and corrupting each other all those took place to a great degree in the clerkenwell prison but in newgate they were carried out to an extent dreadful to think of and associated with other crimes impossible to mention note twenty one i now seem to awake for the first time from a long dream of wickedness and to become aware of the frightful precipice on which i stood my eyes were suddenly opened and i shuddered a man was hanged at the debtor's door while i was in newgate and i saw him pass from the condemned cell to the kitchen which is just within the debtor's door i experienced a sudden revulsion of feeling and took a solemn oath within my own breast that i would never thieve again but as i knew nothing of religion and could not read or write i was not likely to reform very rapidly nor very completely i still laughed and joked with my fellow-prisoners and appeared to enter into most of their fun though i really began to loathe them but when the chaplain visited us and the other boys jeered and mocked him i stood by and dwelt on every word of gentle remonstrance that fell from his lips next sunday i paid great attention to his sermon while pretending to be asleep for if i had been caught actually lending a patient ear to his discourse my fellow-prisoners would have led me no peace afterwards i understood but little very little of that sermon still i gleaned some notion of the existence of a saviour of belief in whom was the stepping-stone to virtue i also heard the happiness of heaven explained for the first time but i must confess that i was greatly puzzled when the chaplain declared that the man who was hanged for a dreadful murder on the preceding monday had gone to that place of joy because he had repented in his last moments for i thought to myself well then a human being is quite safe in leading as terrible a life as he chooses as long as he repents at the end and again i was bewildered when i heard the clergyman say these words which made so great an impression on me that i have never forgotten them and never shall as i stood with that penitent man on the drop last monday morning i envied him his fate because i knew that his soul was about to ascend to heaven note twenty two the day of my trial came and i was placed in the dock before the common sergeant of london the clerk of the court asked me how will you be tried by god and your country i knew not what reply to make and was actually on the point of saying that i would rather not be tried at all this time since it seemed to be left to my own choice and that i would faithfully promise never to thieve again when the turnkey who had charge of me whispered in my ear you damned young fool why don't you speak say by god and my country damn you i did as i was directed and the trial commenced the charge against me was fully proved and a verdict of guilty was recorded the common sergeant asked if i had ever been convicted before the keeper of newgate who was present said i had not the counsel who had been retained for me by old death then requested to be allowed to call witnesses to character this was permitted and three or four tradesmen who i well knew were old death's friends got up one after the other and swore that i had been in their service each one of course giving different periods of time and that i was an honest hard-working and industrious lad until i fell into bad company and got into trouble dykes the runner was then questioned about me and he said that i was not known as a thief although he knew the contrary perfectly well but old death had kept his word and had not spared his gold my offence was however a grave one robbing in a dwelling-house and there were two or three other indictments of the same kind against me though the prosecutors did not come forward old death had made it right with them too i was accordingly condemned to seven years transportation with a hint that this sentence would be commuted to two years imprisonment at the hulks i was but little more than eleven when my career of crime was thus interrupted and i was glad that it was so interrupted for i resolved that it should not be renewed when i regained my liberty this was scarcely a resolution produced by moral considerations but by fear and it therefore required strengthening 
whether it was or not i shall soon inform you a few days after the sessions terminated i was removed with several other boys to the euryalus convict hulk at woolwich this vessel has three decks the upper is appropriated to lads convicted the first time the second to the next grade of juvenile criminals and the third or lowest to the worst kind of offenders i was assigned to the upper deck where there were about sixty of us on being received on board we were first sent to the wash-house where we were bathed and well cleansed and we then received the suit of dark grey that denotes the felon our employment was to make clothes for the entire establishment that is shirts jackets waistcoats and trousers the person who taught us was a convict boy who had been a tailor the cutters out belonged to the second deck and visited our department as often as their services were required we were divided into sections each having at its head a boy selected as a chief on account of his good conduct when in prison i will describe the routine of the day taking the period when the summer regulations are in force at five o'clock in the morning all hands were called the ports were opened the hammocks were lowered and lashed up and we washed ourselves for chapel at half-past five the signal was given for prayers and we went to the chapel in sections or divisions taking our seats in profound silence the morning hymn was sung the schoolmaster read the prayers and we returned to our wards on the upper deck there we stood in ranks till six o'clock when breakfast was served the steward of the ship superintended the giving out of the provisions and saw that each boy had his fair allowance of bread and gruel this being done the steward ordered each rank one after the other to approach the tables hold up the bread say grace and then sit down and eat at half past six we were marshalled on the quarter-deck in divisions and the officers of the hulk were then prepared to hear any complaints or receive any reports that might have to be submitted to them such complaints were noted down for after investigation some of the boys were kept above to wash the quarter-deck and the remainder were sent down to cleanse their own deck at eight o'clock we were all set to work at tailoring a strict silence being preserved at nine o'clock the report upon the complaints was received from the commander of the hulk and the punishments awarded were made known such as a good thrashing with a cane stopping the dinner or a solitary confinement on bread and water at twelve o'clock the dinners were served out the steward superintending the quartermasters and guards were also present to see that one boy's allowance was not taken from him by another from half past twelve to half past one we were allowed to take care and exercise on the quarter-deck but without making any noise at half past one we were marched down again to our work at two a section of one-third of us was sent into the chapel where we were taught reading and writing by the schoolmaster at five we left off work or schooling cleaned the wards and then washed ourselves this being done supper was served out and we went on the quarter-deck again for air and exercise till seven when we were once more marched to the chapel for evening prayers and the catechism at eight o'clock we returned to our own deck where the signal was given for getting out the hammocks and slinging them up at nine profound silence was ordered and the whole ship was then as quiet as if there was not a soul on board this deep tranquillity being only broken by the striking of the bell and the cry of all's well every half hour such was the life led on board the euryalus convict hulk but i was happier much happier there than i had ever been before the schoolmaster was an excellent man and took a delight in teaching those who were anxious to learn i was of this number and my improvement was rapid i quite won his regard and he devoted unusual pains to instruct me so that at the end of a year he obtained leave for me to give up the making of clothes and assist him as an usher this was an employment that pleased me greatly and allowed me plenty of time to read the books lent me by the worthy schoolmaster so fond was i of reading that i used to take a book with me on the quarter-deck at those times devoted to air and exercise and sitting apart from the others i would remain buried in study until it was time to go below again i examined how books were written and how i was accustomed to speak that is i compared the language of those books with my own and i was shocked to find how wretchedly ignorant i had hitherto been in respect to grammar 
this ignorance i strove hard oh very hard to surmount and the good schoolmaster assisted me to the utmost of his power i read and studied the bible with avidity and the more i became acquainted with it the more fixed grow my determination to avoid a relapse into the ways of crime when i should be released during the two years that i passed at the hulk mrs bunce came very often to see me passing herself off as my aunt but relations were not allowed to speak to us except in the presence of a guard and so the name of old death was never mentioned by either of us but mrs bunce used to tell me that my uncle would give me a home when my time was up and i supposed by this that she meant her husband toby i knew that old death was the person who had directed these assurances to be given me and often and often did i lay awake of a night deliberating within myself what i should do when i was set free to earn an honest livelihood and avoid the hateful necessity of returning to the service of mr benjamin bones at length the day of liberation came and i had no plan of proceeding settled my clothes were given to me and a shilling was put into my hand by the steward the old schoolmaster was absent at the time and i was sorry that i had not an opportunity of thanking him for all his kindness and imploring his advice on how to proceed it struck me that i would appeal to the commander of the hulk i did so and solicited him to counsel me how to get an honest livelihood he burst out laughing in my face exclaiming i suppose you think i am to be deceived by your humbug and that i shall put my hand into my pocket and give you a half guinea to see your way with no such thing my lad i used to do so when i was first here but those i assisted in that way were always the first to come back again and he turned on his heel leaving me quite astounded at the reception my sincerity of behaviour had experienced but a few moments reflection showed me that i could scarcely blame him for his conduct and i quitted the ship in tears the moment i stepped from the boat that landed me in woolwich i met mrs bunce she threw her arms around my neck and called me her dear jacob in such a loving manner that one would really have believed her to be my aunt or even my mother if she had chosen to represent herself so then pointing to a public house at a little distance she said your good and kind friend mr bones is there and he will be delighted to see you he has ordered a nice steak and some good ale and we mean to let you enjoy yourself the idea of having such a glorious repast after being kept on short commons on board the euryalus made my mouth water but then i remembered all the influence old death had been accustomed to exercise over me and i knew that if i once again entered within its range i should never have the moral courage to withdraw from it so my mind was made up and suddenly darting down a by-street i was beyond mrs bunce's view in a twinkling i heard her shrill screaming voice call after me but i heeded it not and hurried onward as if escaping from a wild beast presently i relaxed my speed and at length entered a public-house where i called for a pint of beer two or three soldiers and as many young women were sitting at another table drinking and indulging at the same time in the most filthy discourse suddenly one of the females started up advanced towards me and after considering me for a few moments exclaimed with a terrible oath well i thought it must be my old fancy cove jacob and she offered to embrace me i however repulsed her with loathing for in the miserable tattered sickly wretch before me i had already recognized peggy wilkins she seemed ashamed of herself for a minute then recovering her impudence she said damn and blast you for a sulky snivelling hound who the devil are you that you can't treat me civilly do you think i don't know all that's happened to you why you've only this moment left the hulks and you can't deny it the soldiers hearing this demanded if it was true and without waiting for my answer thrust me out of the place i had reached the end of the street when i recollected that i had not received the change for my shilling which i had tendered in payment of the beer i therefore went back to ask for it but the pot-boy who had served me swore that i never gave him a shilling at all and the landlord evidently believed that i was a vagabond endeavouring to swindle his servant so i was kicked out penniless it was for some time before i could muster up courage to adopt any plan for my support indeed 
i sat down in a retired nook and cried bitterly i even regretted having left the hulk so miserable did i feel at last hunger compelled me to act and i entered a shop to inquire if a boy was wanted the man behind the counter said he did not require the assistance of a lad but that a neighbour of his would probably hire me i went to the place pointed out to me and having explained my business was asked for testimonials of good character i candidly confessed that i had just been discharged from the Euryalus, but that i thought the schoolmaster on board would recommend me the man flew into a dreadful passion and rushing round from behind the counter would have kicked me out of the shop if i had not run away of my own accord i am sure that i tried twenty different shops that day in woolwich at some i explained my position at others i carefully concealed the fact of my late ignominious punishment but character 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 where was it even for a starving lad who only asked a fair trial who promised to work from sunrise to sunset and to be content with a morsel of bread to eat and a cellar to sleep in as a recompense for his toils even to one who offered so much and required so little in return character was necessary night came i was famishing and in despair at length a charitable baker gave me a roll and my hunger was appeased it struck me that the tradesmen at woolwich were perhaps more cautious than people elsewhere how they engaged the services of young lads in consequence of that place being a station for the convict hulks and i therefore resolved to try my luck in another quarter i set out for greenwich which i reached at midnight and slept till morning in a shed near some houses that were being built cold famished and dispirited did i awake and with a sinking heart i commenced my rounds before noon i had called at a hundred shops public houses or taverns without success few required the service of boys and those people who did demanded references i begged a piece of bread of a baker and then set off for london so slow did i walk and so often was i compelled to rest that it was evening before i reached the blackfriars road there again did i endeavour to procure honest employment but in vain i remember that when one shopkeeper an old man listened to me with more attention than the rest i burst into tears and implored besought prayed him to receive me into his service if it was only to save me from becoming a thief i did not tell him i had already been one but he shook his head saying sorrowfully if you have already thought of turning thief your morals must be more than half corrupted he gave me a few halfpence and i went away i balanced for some minutes between the cravings of my stomach and the fatigue of my limbs that is whether i should spend those halfpence in food or on a bed i decided in favour of the food and having satisfied my hunger crept into a timber-yard on the bank of the thames and slept there till morning i awoke at sunrise and crossed blackfriars bridge my limbs shivered with ague and my clothes were damp with the dews of night i knew not what to do which way to turn hope had deserted me there was i a poor wretched houseless friendless starving being anxious to remain honest yet impelled by circumstances towards a relapse into the career of vice i prayed as i went along the streets yes i prayed to god to save me from that dreadful that last resource but no succour came all day long did i rove about night arrived again and for twenty-four hours i had eaten nothing i dragged myself back to the timber-yard but there was a great dog prowling about and i dared not enter i sought shelter elsewhere for the rain began to descend in torrents but i was wet through before i could even find the entrance of a court to screen me i never slept a wink that night i was afraid to lie down on the cold stones they were so chill morning came again and i was now so weak that i could hardly put one foot before another i was moreover starving yes starving i passed a baker's shop and saw the nice hot bread smoking in the windows and i went in to implore a stale crust but i was ordered out and then the idea struck me that in a few minutes i might obtain money to buy a good breakfast not only bread but meat and tea 
that was by picking a pocket the idea however assumed a horrible aspect a moment afterwards and i recoiled from it no i would sooner plunge into the river and end my woes there than steal again to the river's brink i hurried dragging myself slowly no more but running yes absolutely running fast to terminate my wretchedness by suicide it was near westminster bridge that i was on the point of throwing myself into the thames when my collar was suddenly grasped from behind and i was drawn back i turned and saw old death then i uttered a scream and struggled dreadfully to get away that i might still accomplish my purpose but he held me tight saying silly boy why do you fly from life since it may yet have many pleasures for you no i cried i will never become a thief again and i will never ask you to do so he replied but come with me and let us talk over your prospects prospects i repeated in a hysterical manner and then i followed him mechanically to an early breakfast-house close by he ordered a plentiful meal and i ate ravenously the food and hot coffee cheered me and i began to feel grateful to bones for having supplied the means to appease the hunger that was devouring me moreover one looks with quite a different eye upon suicide after a good meal and i could not do otherwise than regard him as the saviour of my life i was therefore already prepared to listen to him with attention and when he proposed that we should repair to bunce's where we could converse without fear of being overheard i willingly agreed to accompany him but during our walk to seven dials i constantly repeated within my own breast the most solemn vows not to yield to any threats or representations menaces or coaxings to induce me to become a thief again when we reached the house in earl street mrs bunce received me with more kindness than i had expected to meet at her hands after the trick i had played her a few days before at woolwich but she did not treat me thus without a motive for when once she and old death got me between them they endeavoured to the utmost of their power to persuade me to resume my old avocations i was faithful to my vow and assured them that they might kill me sooner than i would again do anything to risk imprisonment in that horrible newgate it was not the hulk i so much dreaded nor yet transportation because i knew nothing of it but i shrunk from the mere idea of going through the ordeal of newgate a second time old death saw that i was not to be moved at least then and he gave up the point but said he you must do something to get a living you can't starve and we won't maintain you in idleness if you like i'll take you into my service to run on errands look after people that i want to learn anything about and make yourself useful in that way and i'll give you a shilling a day i agreed for i could not starve now of course it is as plain to you as it was even then to me that old death was playing a deep game with me i was the cleverest thief that ever served him and he had received ample ample proofs that he could trust me he knew that he was safe with me i was therefore too useful a person to lose and he thought that by throwing me again amongst my old companions and keeping me on very short allowance the disagreeable impressions of jail would soon wear away and i should relapse into my old habits he was quite mistaken i don't pretend that any particular idea of virtue made a great change in me but i had been in newgate and there i had seen a man going out to be hanged and i thought that if i got into that dreadful jail a second time i should become hardened and that i also should go out some day to be hanged so i resisted all temptation and lived as well as i could on the shilling a day without increasing my means by theft or villainy this mode of life on my part did not suit old death a few weeks passed and when he found that i was resolved not to return to my former ways he stopped my allowance altogether i was now steeped to the very lips in wretchedness and misery but somehow or another i managed to get a crust here and there just to keep body and soul together although i oftener slept in the open air than in a bed mrs bunce showed me a little kindness now and then but quite unknown to old death and to my surprise she did not urge the necessity of my returning to the career of theft for several weeks i saw nothing of mr bones 
but at last he fished me out in some low place and told me i might return into his service if i liked and that he should pay me according to the use i proved myself to be to him to glean information for him run on errands dog and watch persons or even loiter about in police courts to hear what cases came up before the magistrates these were my chief duties and badly enough they were paid but i was now permitted to get my breakfast and tea regularly at the bunces and that was something as for my lodging if i got together a few pence to enable me to hire a bed or a part of a bed in one of those low houses that i have already described to you i was contented for i always had this consolation that i could walk about the streets without being afraid of meeting a bow street runner jacob paused for his tale was told well my boy said tom rain you have gone through much and seen enough to form a good stock of experience i commend your resolution never to put yourself within reach of the law again for that's just my determination also you have got money in your pocket now and i will do something more for you before i leave england ah oh, mr rainford exclaimed jacob much affected how i wish that i had met with such a friend as you earlier in life and how i wish too that i could go with you wherever you are going and be your servant your slave well well jacob we will talk of that another time said tom rest assured i will not desert you call at tullock's on monday evening and you will either see me there or find a note from me jacob was overjoyed at the species of promise thus held out to him and as it was now midnight rainford intimated his intention of taking his departure from the public-house where he had passed the evening with the poor lad when they had issued from the door the highwayman bade jacob good-night and they separated pursuing different roads in fact jacob went towards leather lane while tom rainford repaired in the direction of the lodgings which he at present occupied in gray's inn lane he having removed to that locality from his former abode in locks fields note nineteen the discipline of criminal prisons was particularly lax at the time of which jacob smith is supposed to be speaking note twenty this dreadful state of things continued in the new prison clerkenwell up to the year eighteen thirty eight note twenty one the report of the prison inspectors of the home district contains these observations upon the state of newgate the association of prisoners of all ages and every shade of guilt in one indiscriminate mass is a frightful feature in the system which prevails here the first in magnitude and the most pernicious in effect in this prison we find that the young and the old the inexperienced and the practical offender the criminal who is smitten with a conviction of his guilt and the hardened villain whom scarcely any penal discipline can subdue are congregated together with an utter disregard to all moral distinctions the interest of the prisoners or the welfare of the community in such a state of things can it be a matter of wonder that the effects should be such as have been described every other evil is aggravated by this and it would be worse than idle to attempt a remedy for the rest while this demoralizing intermixture of criminals of all ages and degrees of guilt is suffered to frustrate the very ends of prison discipline and to give tenfold violence to all their mischievous inclinations and passions upon which it is incessantly operating and which is the design of justice to discourage and repress apart from higher considerations sound policy demands that such a system should be instantly rectified for so long as it continues society is nursing a moral pestilence in its bosom and maintaining an institution in which are forged those weapons that are destined to be wielded with fatal dexterity against the community itself every device by which the fences of property may be overcome is here framed and divulged to ready agents every fraudulent artifice every successful trick every ingenious mode of overreaching the cautious or of plundering the unguarded is perfected here and communicated to those who had not hitherto been initiated in the mysteries of crime but the most distressing circumstance connected with this system is the cruel indifference with which it regards the condition and necessities of those on whom the extreme penalty of the law is doomed to fall prisoners actually awaiting the execution of the awful sentence of death are placed by the evil influence of companionship in the most unfavourable circumstances for self-reflection 
religion and humanity combine to point out the imperative necessity of providing men brought by the sentence of the law to the verge of eternity with the means of spiritual improvement and consolation but the system of prison discipline in newgate practically defeats every such merciful design no human authority has a right thus to trifle with the eternal interests of a dying criminal against this serious evil the chaplain has repeatedly and loudly protested and it is in evidence that the unhappy victims themselves have earnestly implored the officers to deliver them from a situation in which it was impossible for them to devote the few remaining hours that the law allowed them to reflection and prayer the companions in guilt of these wretched men become further hardened by the influence of this association the indulgence of thoughtless apathy unfeeling mirth or revolting ribaldry are productive of incalculable mischief to the minds of those who are subjected to their influence the prisoner who witnesses with levity or indifference the last moments of a culprit in newgate comes forth a greater villain than when he went in in him the evil principle has done its work and the very exhibition of terror which justice designed for the reclaiming of the survivors by a perversion of moral influence irremediably hardens the heart which it was intended to soften and amend if human ingenuity were tasked to devise means by which the most profligate of men might be rendered abandoned to the last degree of moral infamy nothing more effectual could be invented than the system now actually in operation within the walls of the first metropolitan prison in england note twenty two fact end of section forty one read by celine major section forty two of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds fresh alarms rainford was within twenty yards of the house in which he dwelt when a woman jostled him somewhat violently as she endeavoured to pass him while pursuing the same direction there was no excuse for this rudeness on her part inasmuch as the pavement was wide in that particular spot and no other person was on the footway i beg your pardon sir said the female i'm sure but bless me she cried in a shrill unmistakable voice if it isn't mr rainford ah mrs bunce returned the highwayman what are you doing in this neighbourhood so late i'm going to pass the night with a relation of mine that's ill and which lives at the top of the lane answered mrs bunce but oh mr rainford what a shocking thing this is about poor dear mr bones what ejaculated tom with a kind of guilty start why sir he's dead poor man sobbed mrs bunce dead and buried sir dead and buried repeated the highwayman mechanically and how came you to know this his friend mr tidmarsh came and told me and toby about it this blessed morning and in the afternoon we all followed the poor old gentleman to the grave in clerkenwell churchyard his death was sudden then said tom anxious to glean how far the woman might be informed relative to the particulars of the event which she was deploring mr tidmarsh isn't given to gossiping sir replied mrs bunce and he said very little about it it was quite enough for us to know that the poor dear old gentleman is gone and without having made any will either so me and toby are thrown as you may say on the wide world without a friend to help us but mr bones was rich very rich was he not demanded tom who felt particularly uncomfortable at this confirmation of his worst fears for he to some extent looked upon himself as the cause of the old fence's sudden death rich god bless you ah, as rich as a king exclaimed mrs bunce but no one knows where he kept his money unless it is that tidmarsh and where did he die asked rainford at tidmarsh's own place in turnmill street clerkenwell was the answer 
poor old man but you must have seen him only a short time before he went off mr rainford she added as if recollecting the fact for it was on that very night when he took toby and jacob over with him to a house in lot's field and which turned out to be where you lived you know he stayed with you while jacob and toby went away poor old man he's a great loss a very great loss were you so dependent on him then asked rainford yes almost entirely as i may say was the reply and then there's poor jacob too what in the world he'll do i'm sure i can't say for me and toby can't afford to keep him now that our best friend's gone but good-night mr rainford i must go on to my cousin's for it's very late and she maybe will pop off the hooks before i get to her good-night returned tom slackening his pace so as to allow the woman to proceed as far ahead of him as possible ere he entered his own dwelling which was now close at hand in a few moments the form of mrs bunce was lost in the darkness of the night rainford was now convinced that old death was indeed no more and no prompt assistance had resuscitated him even if the vital spark were not extinct at the moment when he saw him for the last time bound to the chair at the house in red lion street yes it was clear enough too clear benjamin bones was dead and tidmarsh had pounced upon all his property well let him enjoy it thought rainford within himself i have enough for my purposes and do not wish to dispute the inheritance with him even if i had the right or the power and yet and yet he mused with a feeling like a contraction of the heart i would give ten years of my own life so that i had not been the instrument of abridging this but it's too late to repent or regret repent did i say i have nothing to repent of i did not do this deed wilfully it was not murder and as for any share that i had in the matter at all that does not seem to be suspected oh i can understand master tidmarsh's proceedings it was no doubt he who entered the room just at the moment when i discovered that old death was dead of course he would say nothing about finding him tied in a chair or of me having been with him that night a word on these heads would have excited suspicions led to inquiries coroner's inquest and all that sort of thing then some relation might have turned up claimed the property and cut tidmarsh out yes yes it is plain enough and tidmarsh is a prudent as well as a lucky fellow but what could the laboratory in that house mean what were those pickled human heads kept in the cupboard for and why was dr lascelles familiar with that den even in the midst of his musings rainford did not hazard a conjecture to account for the mysteries just enumerated they indeed appeared unaccountable the highwayman walked some distance past the door of his lodgings to convince himself that he was not watched by mrs bunce and having assured himself on that head at least so far as he could judge in the darkness of the night he turned back and entered his dwelling the next day was the sabbath and rainford was sitting after breakfast reading a sunday paper in the neat parlour of his lodgings on the other side of the fire sat a young beautiful and dark-haired woman in all the rich flush of jewish beauty the softly sweeping outline and symmetrical undulations of her form being developed rather than concealed by the loose morning wrapper which she wore while the ray of the frosty morning sun glanced on the glossy surface of her raven hair little charlie watts nicely dressed and with his rosy countenance wearing the smiles of happy innocence was seated on a footstool near tom rain looking at a picture-book but every now and then glancing affectionately towards those whom he had already learnt to love as if they were his parents do the advertisements tell you when the next ship will sail from liverpool to new york tom inquired the lady next friday my love answered rainford we will therefore leave london on thursday four more days remarked his female companion oh how glad i shall be when we are out of sight of england and yet she added with a profound sigh i can scarcely bear the thought of parting perhaps for ever you must not give way to those mournful reflections interrupted tom in a kind tone remember that we are going to a country where my personal safety will not be endangered 
where we shall not be obliged to shift our lodgings half a dozen times in a fortnight and where too we need not start at every knock that comes to the door we shall be as happy as the day is long and with the money which i now have at my disposal i may embark in some honest pursuit and earn myself a good name the money will be at the new york bankers before we reach america i suppose said the lady inquiringly to be sure replied tom since i paid it all into the hands of the london agent two days ago have you taken care of the receipt or acknowledgment i locked it up in the little iron box together with all your other papers was the answer and those documents that i brought home with me the other night or rather morning all safe dear tom but really when you allude to that dreadful night you make me shudder oh how long how long did those weary hours seem until you returned when you came up into the bedroom and told me that you were going away with that dreadful man bones that the time had at length come that opportunity had at last served your purposes well my dear girl i recollect all that took place interrupted tom laughing you begged me not to go with him you said you had your misgivings but i was resolved for such an occasion might not have occurred again did i not tell you beforehand when we were down in the country that if i came up to london and purposely threw myself in the way of old death accident would be sure sooner or later to enable me to wrench from his grasp that gold of which he had plundered me and have not my words come true you must not reproach me now dear girl at all events for the danger is over yes and the dreadful man is dead exclaimed the jewess in a tone which expressed a thanksgiving so unequivocally that a cloud for a moment gathered on rainford's brow he is dead and can molest us no more he observed in a serious tone but i could have wished however he added abruptly let us avoid that subject it is not altogether an agreeable one and now to return to our intended departure for america i am somewhat at a loss how to act in respect to that letter which i obtained last night from jacob smith and which so deeply regards he paused and glanced significantly towards charlie what can you do in the matter tom said his beautiful companion the letter is too ambiguous scarcely ambiguous but deficient in certain points of information interrupted rainford which is equally mortifying added the jewess you cannot risk your safety by remaining in england to investigate the affair even if we had not gone so far in our arrangements for departure certainly not replied tom but i was thinking that i would entrust the letter to my friend clarence villiers and who knows but that some accident may sooner or later throw him into the way of sifting the mystery to the very bottom your project is an excellent one answered the jewess but are you sure that he does not suspect suspect what i really am ejaculated the highwayman with that blithe merry laugh of his which showed his fine white teeth to such advantage not he he does not know sir christopher blunt nor the lawyer howard and his acquaintance with that consummate fool frank curtis was always slight and not likely to be improved by all that has occurred for frank must suspect that clarence had something to do with the elopement of old torrance's daughters so all things considered clarence cannot have heard of the little affair by which sir christopher lost his two thousand pounds then you will entrust mr villiers with the letter said the lady inquiringly yes i will call upon him this evening responded tom for i have a little hint to give him relative to a certain aunt of his at this moment there was a knock at the front door of the house and the servant presently made her appearance to inform rainford that a young man named jacob smith wished to speak to him tom's brow darkened as the thought flashed across him that the lad had dogged him on the preceding night but instantly recovering his self-possession he desired the jewess and charlie to retire to another room while he received the visitor when jacob entered the parlour rainford looked sternly at him but said nothing i know what is what must be passing in your mind sir said jacob hastily but you wrong me that is if you think i found out your address by any underhand means of my own 
"'Sit down, my boy,' cried Tom, frankly. "'I am sorry if I suspected you even for an instant. "'But what has brought you here this morning, and how—' "'I will explain all in a few moments, Mr. Rainford,' said Jacob. Two hours ago, at about eight o'clock, "'I went up to Bunce's just to see if they had heard anything of old death. "'And to my surprise I learnt that he was buried yesterday. "'So I have already heard, but go on.' "'You know I told you last night that yesterday morning two or three people called in Earl Street "'to inquire about old death, as he had promised to get a thief off at the police court. "'Well, at that time, it seems, neither Mrs. Bunce or Toby knew what had become of Mr. Bones. "'But just afterwards, as I'm told, and when I had gone away from the house, "'up goes old Tidmarsh, the fence, with the news that Mr. Bones was dead "'and that the funeral was going to take place in a couple of hours.' "'Quick work, wasn't it, sir? "'Sir Toby Bunce and his wife went to the funeral, "'and now it's certain what was really become of old death. "'Tidmarsh told them he died suddenly three or four days ago "'at his house of apoplexy. "'I'm sure he didn't look much like an apoplectic man. "'The best part of all this I learnt last night, "'soon after I left you,' said Rainford. "'And I only heard it when I went up to Bunce's this morning,' "'remarked Jacob. "'Well, sir,' When Mrs. Bunce had told me this, she said, "'Jacob, I want you to do a particular favour for me, and I will give you a sovereign.' I asked her what it was. "'I'm pretty sure,' she says, "'that Mr. Rainford lives somewhere in Gray's Inn Lane, between Lickerpond Street and Colthorpe Street, on the same side of the way as those streets, and you must find out where it is, became I want particularly to know.' So I promised her I would, and of course took good care not to say that I had seen you last night, but I was determined to give you notice of Mrs. Bunce's desire to have you watched, and I have been knocking at every door in the neighbourhood, asking if such a gentleman as yourself lived there. In describing you, however, I did not mention any name. That was right, Jacob, said Tom, because I am not known as Rainford here, but what the devil can the old wretch want with me? Has she inherited old death's scheming disposition? or does his vengeance pursue me even from the tomb? These last words were totally unintelligible to Jacob, who knew not that the highwayman had had any share in the death of Mr. Benjamin Bones. "'Of course, sir,' remarked the lad after a pause, "'I shall go to Mrs. Bunce this evening and assure her that no such person as yourself lives in this neighbourhood. I hope you are not offended with me for hunting after you.' "'Far from it, Jacob,' returned Tom. "'for I am sure I can trust you. "'At the same time, you must be cautious how you act, "'so as not to let Mrs. Bunce imagine that you are playing her false. "'Try and find out what she wants with me, "'and meet me at Tullock's tomorrow evening, between seven and eight. "'No, not at Tullock's either, "'because that woman knows I am in the habit of going there. "'But come to me at the public house in Baldwin's Buildings, "'where we were last night. "'Remember, tomorrow evening, at about half-past seven. "'I shall not fail, sir,' responded Jacob, and then he took his departure. The moment he was gone, Rainford hastened up the stairs to the bedroom, whither the Jewess and little Charlie had retired, and closing the door, he said, "'My dear girl, we must be off directly. That horrid woman, Mrs. Bunce, of whom I have spoken to you, is after me, and I am afraid for no good.' "'Off!' exclaimed the lady. "'What, to Liverpool at once?' "'No, but to another lodging, or to a tavern, rather, "'for it will be difficult to obtain apartments on a Sunday. "'I must stay in town for a day or two longer, "'or at least till I have seen Villiers. "'Come, pack up your things, my love, and let us be gone.' "'Are you afraid of that lad who has just been?' demanded the Jewess. "'Not a whit. He is staunch to the backbone, I will swear to it. "'But he might be followed, or he might commit himself somehow or another "'and betray me involuntarily.' "'By the by,' ejaculated Tom, after an instant's pause, "'I tell you what we will do. "'We will return to Locke's Fields. "'It is clear that Mrs. Bunce has found out "'that we are not living there now. "'Otherwise she would not have sent this Jacob to watch me, "'which she has done, "'and she would never suspect that we have gone back to our old quarters. "'So look alive, my love, and pack up the things "'while I settle with our landlady here and send for a coach.' Tom Rain's directions were speedily obeyed, and by midday the Jewess, Charlie, and himself were once more located in Locke's Fields. 
End of section 42.